Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. Welcome to episode 96, and good gracious, great balls of fire. We are so freaking close to 100 episodes. It's bananas. Can't believe that we have been together for like three years. What the heck? I love it. Ooh. We're going to do something very special for the 100th episode because it's the 100th episode and it only comes once, right? So what we are going to be doing is a live recording of episode 100. So I'll be recording it and it will also be posted regularly on here, but I wanted to get questions from you, my delicious little donut. And once again, Mama TK will be here. So if you have any questions for her or for myself, Anything is fine. History topics, life topics, anything topics, you can either send in your question via email or head over to Instagram and I'll be putting a bunch of question boxes up for you to do all the time. So uh, you can also DM if you would like to as well. There's also going to be a little giveaway, so stay tuned for that. And with that, let's get on to episode 96. This season, we have had a non-binary spy, unhinged popes, some Mongolian queens, and today we'll be talking about a legendary sorceress queen. So let's hop into the time machine and take a little trip to 19th century Niger. Grab your snack and a little drink, drink, and let's get to it. The late 1800s is what I like to call the colonial cluster. Europe and other countries were running all over the world, just scooping up land and ruining people's lives. And this went doubly for the continent of Africa. Until the late 1800s, colonization of West Africa was limited to the coast. Not much was done in the interior. That was until 1876, when King Leopold II of Belgium decided it was his job to explore and, air quote, civilize the continent. Luxury goods like ivory that were found in the interior were making a lot of money, and of course, they needed to be the first to control those goods and control that land. This was his duty, after all, you know, as a king, whatever. Barf, gag me with a spoon. Gross, Leopold, no, but that's what he thought. So from 1878 to 1885, Leopold had his little cronies all up in West Africa, causing all sorts of atrocities while civilizing the people there. Other countries were starting to get the same idea, and there began a mad dash to grab a slice of the Africa pie, which is literally what they called it. In order to keep the colonizing activities civil amongst themselves, 14 countries from Europe and elsewhere got together to decide who got what slice of the Africa pie. Those countries included Germany, Austria, Hungary, Spain, Denmark, the United States, France, United Kingdom, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Sweden, Norway, and the Ottoman Empire, and also the International Congo Society. Now, don't get too excited about that one, my friend, because it was not actually made up of people from the Congo. It was actually Leopold and his friends. They cared not for the people of the Congo and were formed with the express purpose of establishing control of the Congo Basin and exploiting its economic resources. That was like literally their whole job. Not a single person from West Africa was there to speak on behalf of West African interests. And we could have a whole episode on what went on in the conference, but basically they divided the land and made rules amongst themselves for trading. And it put colonization into hyperdrive. It wasn't long after the end of the Berlin Conference that France figured out what Belgium was doing, sending its explorers to assert their power and snatch up as much land, goods, resources, and people as they possibly could. France decided that they would do the same and sent some missions to West Africa. One of these missions was led by Captain Paul Voulet and Julien Chanoinet. And creatively, the mission was called the Voulet Chanoinet Mission. 
They were sent to Africa by the French government to conquer the territories between the Niger River and Lake Chad, which is in like the upper west part of the African continent. Their job was to unify all French territories in West Africa. And on that mission, what these two men did to the people in this area is one of the most horrific episodes in France's colonization history. At the beginning, nothing was out of the ordinary. They didn't meet much resistance when it came to claiming the land between Niger and Chad. Usually, the villages and kingdoms would surrender and the mission would move through. That was until they heard of the Anzu people and their sorceress queen. The Anzu people are a subgroup of the Hausa. Hausa are a native ethnic group in West and Central Africa, and they speak the Hausa language, which, fun fact, is the most spoken language right after Arabic in the Afro-Asiatic language family. That is really interesting. I did not know that. Well, I, I did. That's why I'm telling you. But I didn't know that before I knew that. So that's what I mean. <laughs> And one of the coolest things about these people, who do still very much exist in modern-day Niger, is the fact that they were ruled by women. They had a matrilineal thing going on, and it was so freaking cool. These women leaders were known as Sarawina, meaning queen or female chief in the Hausa language. There have been hundreds of Sarawina in Anzu history, but the name has become synonymous with the yellow-eyed sorceress queen, Sarawina Mangu. Unfortunately, we know nothing of her early life, and I swear if I had a dollar for every time I said that, I would be a wealthy, wealthy woman. We don't know where she was born, not who her parents were, not a gosh darn thing. Even things we do know about her are shrouded in mystery and sprinkled with fantasy. She has become, like many other powerful women in history, Arthurian and larger than life. But I am getting a bit ahead of myself. Sarawina Mangu was the chief of the Anzu when Vole and Shanoine and their band of soldiers arrived in Niger. As they marched closer and closer to her village, Sarawina grew uneasy. No one was defending themselves against these French invaders, which made them bolder and more deadly. You see, this mission was not only taking land, but it began leaving a trail of death and destruction in its wake. It seemed that Voulet and Chanoine were in a battle to outdo one another's cruelty, to see who could commit the most heinous act of violence and I don't use hate lightly, but I hate these two. They are the official garbage humans of the season. I swear to you, they are the worst. The mayor and governor of garbage human town for the things that they did to the people of Niger. As the mission advanced, it seemed like these two demons in human form could not be stopped. Village after village was burned to the ground with little to no resistance. And here's the kicker. Their mission was not supposed to go anywhere near the Anzu village. But when they heard of the legendary panther queen, Sarawina Mangu, they abandoned their orders and made their way straight to her. Which, the audacity, the audacity and just the stupidity what the heck? I hate these two. I truly do. I truly, truly do. Saruina Mangu's reputation preceded her. She was not new to defending herself and her people. Years before this, she had successfully stopped the Tuarge, who attempted several raids on her village. And then she fought off the Fulani people, who wanted to convert her people to Islam since they were an animistic culture, meaning they believed the gods were in nature and animals. She defeated both of these attackers on multiple occasions, and in the end, she created peace treaties with them. She was known as the legendary Panther Queen, and if she could defend her people against these two groups, then she could do it again against the French, right? 
In an effort to strengthen her numbers, she asked the Tuarje and Fulani people for support. They were now on peaceful terms, and she thought that they too would want to protect their people. But they said, nope, sorry friend, we're taking the L, we're gonna, we're gonna not get involved. And she was super bummed, realizing that she was utterly alone with only herself and her warriors. Saruina began preparing. Much of what comes next is a mix of oral history, mythology, and diary entries from the soldiers and officers that fought in what would come to be known as the Battle of Blugu, which was the name of Sarina's city. It is a fact that when the French came to the city, they were met with a force unlike they had ever seen since arriving to Niger. This was the first time the French mission had lost so many people in battle. The Anzu and their Panther Queen were relentless, and in the end, the French retreated. The only official French military record of this battle, however, was how many bullets were used in the battle, which is just... uh, I have no words for what it is, but it makes me mad. It makes me very upset that the only thing they did was... Write down, when we use this many bullets. GTFO. I just can't. I can't with them. So the French retreated. They were like, we gotta, we gotta get out of here. And they should have stayed away. They weren't supposed to be there in the first place. And the garbage humans should have gone back to their mission. But they were so consumed with whatever bloodlust had come over them that they returned soon after they retreated. However, When they did, they found the city was a ghost town. Not a soul in sight. Not a chicken, not a cat, nor mouse. Some even said the birds and the bugs were gone. The whispers began that the sorceress queen had used her magic to whisk away her people and every living thing in the city. The mission made camp inside the ghost town. And just when they thought that they could let their guard down, Saroina and her warriors emerged from the darkness and raided their camp. This happened night after night. No one could rest. Morale was at an all-time low, and conscripted soldiers, mostly African men forced to join the French, fled the city. And it's also said that some joined the sorceress queen. Others were so frightened by the nightmares that they had, that they simply vanished or ran away. Word of Saruina's supposed magical powers spread through the camp and made their way up the ranks and all the way back to France. These rumors weren't the only thing to make it back. The tales of the unspeakable acts of violence and cruelty by Voulet and Chanoinet reached the ears of the top French military officials. They were appalled and quickly sent out a local governor to put a stop to the madness. Freaking finally, thank you. But by this point, the mission had collapsed on itself. Soldiers were gone, the officers ran amok, and the two top garbage humans themselves had gone too far. When the governor arrived, Voulet shot him and renounced his friend's citizenship. Because I can't even talk. This is so crazy. So Voulet shot the governor that came. Just point blank shot the guy. Killed him. Renounced his French citizenship. Declared himself a black chief of a new empire. Which is so fucked up on so many levels that I once again am rendered speechless at the audacity, the disgustingness of this human being. And throughout this whole time, Saruina and her warriors never let up on the guerrilla warfare, raiding and fighting nonstop. In the end, just three months after they arrived in Lagu, Valet and Chanoine were assassinated by their own soldiers fed up with the constant attacks 
and unhinged behavior. This mission never did take the Anzu people, and according to legend, after the fighting was over, Saruina transformed into her spirit animal, the panther, and disappeared into the forest, never to be seen again. She had used the last of her magic to save her people and left the human world behind. At least, that's how the legend goes. Unfortunately, we will never know what really happened to this legendary woman. Colonization wiped out the oral traditions of the Ansu people. In the battles that followed, many storytellers and traditions were lost. But a good story never stays hidden for long. In the 1980s, her legend was reborn in a novel by Aboilae Mamani, and later in a movie. Her name and image now appear in countless songs, ballads, works of art, ballets, building names, and even gas stations. The Sorceress Queen may have slipped into the night like a panther, but her memory will surely never fade. Well, dear one, that was a short and sweet episode. I hope you enjoyed it. There truly is not a lot of information on Sarawina and this event in general, but what does remain is fascinating and definitely should be told. For our final thought today, I have a movie recommendation for you, and it is the movie about the Panther Queen herself. I know this is very, very much a historical fiction, and it was made quite a long time ago, but it is an excellent movie that gives a really beautiful insight into the Anzu culture, and it's actually available on YouTube, which is great. So I will put a link to that in the show notes below. It has English subtitles, so you'll definitely have to sit down to watch this one, but um, unless you speak the Hausa language, then you don't have to. <laughs> but if you don't, you know, the subtitles are great and it is for sure worth the watch. So I hope that you enjoy it. Well, dear one, we have come to the end of our episode. Can we uh, consider this an Empress Batty episode? I think we can. And uh, maybe an honorary Empress Batty. Yeah, why not? We make the rules here so we can do whatever we want. So yes, honorary Empress Batty episode. <laughs> So I hope you enjoyed this Empress Batty episode. And if you did, please consider sharing it to your other history BFF or with somebody who you think would get a kick out of this episode because word of mouth is super helpful and a really great way to support the podcast. You can also support the podcast in other ways by writing a rating or review, joining Patreon, getting some sweet, sweet merch, or going the free 99 way and sharing for the love of history on your social media platform. Whatever you do, thank you so much for being here each week. You mean the world to me. So you better do something nice for yourself, okay? Because uh, you got to treat the people that I like nicely. Please and thank you. So do something to make yourself happy. Of course, drink your water. Take a little safety sip together, okay? And I will see you next week when we talk about the French rat trials. And it is exactly what you think it is, my friend. <laughs> Okay, love you. See you later. Bye. Why is there a metronome right now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs>